Our next speaker, Stephen Kinzer, is a former New York Times reporter and is currently a world affairs columnist for the Boston Globe. Having taught at both Northwestern University and Boston University, he is also currently a senior fellow in international and public affairs at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. A longtime critic of America's interventionist foreign policy, Kinzer's books include Bitter Fruit, the story of the American coup in Guatemala, All the Shah's Men, an American coup in the roots of Middle East terror, Overthrow, America's century of regime change from Hawaii to Iraq, The Brothers, John Foster Dulles, Alan Dulles, and their secret world war, and most recently, The True Flag, Theodore Roosevelt, Mark Twain, and the Birth of American Empire, all of which I have read and all of which I cannot recommend too highly. There are absolutely fantastic books on America's uh, history of foreign interventionism. The title of Stephen's talk is Regime Change, Roots of the Imperial Temptation. Please welcome Stephen Kinzer. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here and especially uh, to be following two uh, such eminent scholars. Uh, you've now been given by the last two speakers a, a picture of where we were around the period of the early 1960s and the Kennedy assassination. So I've been asked to give something like a prequel to those speeches. Uh, how did we get here? I've been told by my publishers that uh, journalist memoirs never sell. The only people that ever buy them are other journalists. Uh, therefore, uh, despite my efforts, I've been told by several publishers, you're, you're never going to sell a memoir. Forget it. So I've, I've dropped out the idea of ever writing a memoir, but I do have a title. My other books usually work the other way. I get the book done and then come up with a title. Now I have a title for which there never will be a book. But it does encapsulate my approach to uh, trying to understand America and the world. It's a line from one of those old movies that I love to watch um, called Arsenic and Old Lace. Remember that movie with Cary Grant? So uh, for those of you that uh, forgot that one, um, Cary Grant plays a young man who goes to visit his elderly aunts. And they run a rooming house in which they poison the guests. That's the that's the theme of this comedy. And there's a wonderful spot in the movie where Cary Grant turns to one of his aunts to try to understand what's happening. The aunt says, oh, the gentleman died because he drank wine that had poison in it. And Cary Grant's eyes pop open and he says, but how did the poison get in the wine? That's going to be the title of my non-existent memoir. That's all I ask myself. So the wine of world peace and discord and, and uh, social peace in the United States has been poison. How did the poison get in the wine? Essentially, I've devoted my career to trying to answer that question. The answers are not to be found uh, just in the last few years. And I want to try to take us back to the beginnings and a, a little bit of the story of how we got to this point that has been so aptly uh, described, particularly in, in uh, that last speech. Uh, we sometimes look for the roots of uh, America's uh, reckless intervention in the world in the period after World War II. I think that's a mistake. That's too late. It actually began before that. You can look at the period of American imperial expansion essentially in three sections. First, we created a continental empire inside North America. Second, in the period around the end of the 19th century, we moved towards creating an overseas empire. And then the final phase came after World War II when we moved to the idea of creating global empire. But our first great debate over whether this was a good idea took place in the wake of the Spanish-American War. This was a huge debate that involved the entire United States. And this is something that was new to me as I began 
my research for my most recent book. I always understood that it was the period of the Spanish-American War that led us into the period of imperial expansion. It was that moment when we decided North America's not enough for us. We need to project our coercive and military power further than that. And that was the period when, of course, we took the Philippines and Guam and Puerto Rico and assumed responsibility for Cuba and began setting out on the path that has led us to where we are now. I had always understood, however, that we made this decision more or less automatically, that it was just the logical next step. We got to California, and then the next step was Hawaii and the Philippines. It was a sort of a uh, reasonable progression in which the American people were complicit. But actually, the opposite is true. The United States erupted in a nationwide debate over whether this was a good idea. In the summer of 1898, there was a great uh, explosion of anti-imperialist uh, sentiment in the United States. A war that began with the purpose of liberating Cuba turned during that summer into something very different. Suddenly, after having sunk the Spanish fleet in the Philippines, we began to think, maybe we should take the Philippines, we should take Hawaii, we should replace Spain, we should join other European nations in the scramble for territories and influence around the world. This created an eruption of protest. And during that year, 1898 and through 1899, this was the subject that riveted the American people. I can tell you from many hours cranking microfilms in the New York Public Library dark room that this was on the front pages of every newspaper every day. Every major American political and intellectual leader took sides in this debate. In the autumn of 1898, President McKinley decided that he would impose on Spain a treaty by which we would take the Philippines and other uh, Spanish possessions and embark on our imperial project. At this point, anti-imperialist sentiment became intense. An organization called the Anti-Imperialist League emerged. It had chapters all around the United States. It staged hundreds of public meetings, distributed hundreds of thousands of leaflets and broadsides, lobbied intensively in Washington. Uh, it's a piece of our history that we've forgotten because I think it's something that uh, maybe we're not uh, told is a good thing for us to remember. But when you go back and read, as I have, the speeches that were made at that time, you can't help but be struck with how prescient the anti-imperialists were in those days. Let me just give you an example or two. The very first anti-imperialist meeting in American history was held on June 15, 1898, at Faneuil Hall in Boston. It was exactly on this theme I mentioned. Shall we now use the Cuban War as an excuse to become an imperial power? That speech was, that, that uh, rally was opened by a speech by Reverend Charles Ames, a leading uh, Unitarian theologian of that era. Ask yourself how true this came. The policy of imperialism threatens to change the temper of our people and to put us into a permanent attitude of arrogance, testiness, and defiance toward other nations. Once we enter the field of international conflict as a great military and naval power, we shall be one more bully among bullies. We shall only add one more to the list of oppressors of mankind. That was 1898. Uh, now, that autumn, President McKinley decided that he would proceed with the project of annexation and world power. He instructed his negotiators in Europe to impose this treaty on Spain, and that treaty had to be ratified by the U.S. Senate. This set off a 32-day debate in the Senate over whether this was the right thing to do or not. Other than the time when the Founding Fathers gathered to write our Constitution, there has never been a debate in our history when so many Gifted figures came together to de debate so profoundly an issue so heavily fraught with meaning for the entire world. Some ways I envy 
those senators and those Americans who lived then because they had this great debate. Is projecting our military and coercive power around the world a good thing or is that a bad thing? Will it help us? Will it help peace? Or will it undermine peace? This is a debate that we don't have anymore. That's why I envy them. We debate, is 3,000 troops the right number for our surge in Afghanistan or is 6,000 a better number? We never debate the larger questions. And here was the last time the United States did that. Uh, I must say that going through the debates, uh, the text of that 32-day debate is, is quite humbling. Every issue on the question of intervention that we now discuss was first discussed then. So all of American foreign policy can effectively be reduced down to one question or, or down to one word, really. It's intervention. Where do we intervene? When? Under what circumstances? With what tools? With what goals? And that hasn't changed over a period of more than 100 years. So the arguments that we used on both sides when we debated as a nation whether to intervene in Vietnam, Central America, Iraq, Syria, are the very same ones that were used in this debate uh, in the early months of 1899 in the US Senate. Uh, yeah, the one depressing thing about that uh, debate is that the senators then were so much more articulate. <laughs> Even the bad guys were brilliant. <laughs> Their speeches are masterpieces of classical oratory laced with references to Pliny the Elder, the Catiline Conspiracy, things you would never dream of discussing with a U.S. senator today. Um, that re that uh, debate is so full of meaning, I, I want to suggest that somehow maybe the Friends of Freedom would like to publish it uh, as, a, as a pamphlet so that Americans can see how these debates were so brilliantly argued at that time. Uh, I'm not going to go into this in great depth, but let me just give you one quick exchange between the two Republican senators from Massachusetts, uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, who was the great Mephistopheles of the Imperial Project back then, and uh, his opposite number, George Frisbee Hoare, who was an outspoken anti-imperialist. And both of these arguments are arguments you still hear today. Here's Henry Cabot Lodge. I do not believe that this nation was raised up for nothing. I have faith that it has a great mission in the world, a mission of good, a mission of freedom. I believe it can live up to that mission. Therefore, I want to see it step forward boldly and take its place at the head of nations. This led Senator George Frisbee Hoare to leap to his feet and reply, you have no right at the cannon's mouth to impose on an unwilling people your declaration of independence and your constitution and your notions of freedom and what is good. This debate riveted America. Foreign diplomats based in Washington were sending back reports every day about how it was going because all understood that this debate was not only going to shape the United States, it was going to shape the future of the entire world. Newspapers were filled with uh, tallies from day to day, how many senators on this side and that side, which senator has been offered a federal judgeship in order to vote for the treaty, which, by the way, he did get. Uh, another senator got something even better than a federal judgeship, if you're a senator, which is the right to name all the postmasters in your home state. Nothing better than that if you're a senator. Uh, so the debate went on, as I said, for 32 intense days. And the final result was that the U.S. decided to ratify this treaty meaning not only, as everyone in the Senate realized, that we were going to take the Philippines, but that we were going to set off on a new national path, the margin was one vote more than the required two-thirds majority for that treaty. One vote. The anti-imperialists then appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. They argued, first of all, that the U.S. government has no powers other than those specifically granted in the Constitution. And the Constitution nowhere says that the U.S. government has the right to send troops to foreign countries. Uh, they also argued that it was not 
legal for the US to govern people anywhere in the world without giving them constitutional rights, which would, of course, have meant the instant end of the imperial project. Uh, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, this imperial project was legal and constitutional by a vote of five to four. One vote. Uh, and interestingly enough, the uh, justice who wrote the majority decision had recently participated in the majority decision on the Plessy versus Ferguson case, which of course uh, ruled that not all Americans deserve the same amount of rights, and therefore if you believe that, it's logical to believe that we don't have to give rights to people in other countries either. Uh, so uh, the anti-imperialists were defeated for a time. I think they did slow down the project. Don't forget that in those days we annexed countries. We didn't just govern them and rule them. We took them over. We stopped doing that. The Philippine War was a huge shock, I think, to many Americans, including Theodore Roosevelt, who had strongly promoted it. We truly believed, as our leaders told us, that we were going to be welcomed. We were going to have flowers thrown at us, uh, to use a modern term, uh, as we arrived in the Philippines. Things didn't work out that way. We left over 200,000 Filipinos dead. We had our first big torture scandal. Uh, it was a real loss of innocence for Americans, even those that wanted to ignore what we had done in the Mexican War and what we'd done in our wars against Native Americans. One of the things I realized from writing this book was a great discovery. For me, the big discovery of my new book is that this debate ever happened. Uh, but I learned some other things uh, when writing it. And one has to do with Mark Twain. So I grew up with what I now realize is a very partial view of Mark Twain. Mr. Nice Guy, everybody loved him. He sat on his front porch, he rocked, he had nice white curls and uh, told funny jokes, just like your beloved grandfather. This was not the complete Mark Twain, let me tell you. Mark Twain was a vituperative anti-imperialist. Many of the uh, quotes uh, and, that I use from Mark Twain in my book don't appear in anthologies or biographies of Mark Twain. Like many people, I think he's been bleached for our public consumption. Uh, we've taken away the, the edge. Mark Twain wrote that American soldiers fighting in foreign wars were carrying a polluted musket under a bandit's flag. And he even wanted to change the flag of the United States to replace the stars with skull and crossbone symbols. I have to tell you in the context of today when we're looking back to see how people understood exactly what was going to happen, uh, I have to read you this one little piece from Mark Twain, which probably you haven't read since it doesn't appear in many places. After the Americans did, through the Senate vote, decide to pursue the career of uh, international coercive power, Mark Twain was horrified. Mark Twain had traveled the world. He had seen the faces of uh, European imperialism in India and in South Africa. He was once invited to be a, a toastmaster at a dinner for Winston Churchill. And after all the other speakers, the other toastmasters, to, uh, spoke about the great friendship between the US and Britain, uh, Twain got up and said that he had knew what America had done in the Philippines and he'd seen what the British did in South Africa. So he wanted to toast to British, Britain and the United States as truly kin in sin. <laughs> Here is a little script, a scrap that Mark Twain wrote in his depression over the U.S. decision to take this imperial course in the world. Ask yourself if this didn't come true or could it be written today? It was impossible to save the great republic. She was rotten to the core. Lust of conquest had long ago done its work. Trampling upon the helpless abroad had taught her by natural process to endure with apathy the like at home. The government was irrevocably in the hands of the prodigiously rich and their hangers-on. The suffrage was become a mere machine, which they used as they chose. There was no principle but commercialism, no patriotism but of the pocket. 1899. Uh, now, uh, the course of the debate in American history between intervention and non-intervention 
uh, between a policy of prudent restraint and a policy of more aggressive intervention uh, has been fascinating to follow. We've never really resolved this debate. In fact, sometimes I think Americans are not full-hearted imperialists. Um, we got into this business almost by accident. We never were really sure we liked it. It's not like the British and the French and the Spanish who sat down and decided, we're going to have a world empire. Here's how we're going to start. We didn't do it that way, and we're still conflicted. Uh, I used to feel that a good analogy for American, the history of American intervention in the world would be something like, uh, let's say, a tide that comes in and goes out, that some days we get very excited about the supposed wrongs we've suffered in the world and we want to go out and strike uh, down the evildoers. Uh, then uh, the costs of intervention become clear, the sorrows of empire emerge, the body bags come back, and we go enter into a period of more calm. We don't intervene so much until the cycle starts again. Or you could use the analogy of a, a pendulum. It swings. Sometimes we're more this way, sometimes we're more that way. But actually, the more I reflect on it, the more I think that those analogies are inexact. In fact, we don't swing back and forth between wanting to intervene and not wanting to intervene. We, we want to do both. We hold opposite opinions in our minds as Americans. I think Americans really do want every country to guide itself, but we also want to guide the world. <laughs> you can't believe both of those things because they're opposites, but we do. Forced to make a choice, we choose both. And that's the uh, source of the uh, uncertain policy the United States follows in the world. In the period after uh, that first burst of imperialism at the end of the 19th century, uh, the United States entered into a remarkable period of calm in world affairs. Even Teddy Roosevelt, who's probably the greatest nation grabber in American history, moved on to other issues when he became president. After that first intervention, when he seized land for the Panama Canal, uh, he never ordered another intervention in which a single life was lost. He, he began to understand, having promoted the Philippine intervention and seeing the results, uh, that it would be better for him to spend his time on other things. And he moved on to protecting the environment and confronting big business. The Republican presidents who followed, uh, at, particularly uh, in the teens and 20s, uh, were remarkably non-interventionist. The greatest uh, anti-imperialist president the United States ever had was Herbert Hoover. Uh, Hoover takes a bad rap in history because of his response to the Depression, but he was a true humanitarian. Hoover had lived in about a dozen different countries. Um, and saw the world very much from the perspective of uh, non-Americans. So uh, that was a moment when the United States began withdrawing troops from foreign wars. I counted at least six countries uh, where American companies came to President the White House and told them they've got a problem with the government in that country and would the US government please intervene? And uh, President Hoover said, no, it will never be the job of the US government to intervene in a dispute between an American company and some foreign government. Imagine a president saying that today. Um, this, of course, was all based on the uh, experience of World War I. I think this is another uh, intervention that's ripe for re-examination. Uh, World War I is truly the founding tragedy of our age. Without World War I, there's no Nazis, no Hitler, no Holocaust. Uh, no communist revolution in Russia, no Bolshevism. Um, had the United States not intervened in World War I, the war probably would have dragged on for a couple of more years, and the European powers would have come up with some settlement in which some would have gotten some things and some would have gotten some other things. Instead, our intervention made sure that one side achieved total victory and the other side suffered total defeat, and that led to the unraveling of the world to the point that we're seeing it today. Now, this same process began uh, again in the 1930s as World War II was shaking Europe, having been uh, pulled into one European war. Uh, we were vulnerable to being pulled into another one. Uh, the United States emerged from World War II uh, tremendously self-satisfied. The flood of books, magazine articles, uh, video games, uh, movies about World War II, it's unending. Uh, you couldn't fill, uh, you'd have more 
than enough books to fill this room with just the pr production of one year. Why is that? Well, was World War II a hugely important episode? Of course. Did it shape the modern world? Yes. But I think there's another reason we focus so much on World War II. World War II shows the United States the way we like to think we are. It shows that we went into countries where there was evil dictatorship. We withdrew. We left democracy. We love this story. We can't get enough of it. Many other stories come out the other way. We simply ignore those stories. We pretend that they never happened. And those were some of the stories that began unfolding in the 1950s. Now, as I said, it was the period after World War II when the United States decided to take its overseas empire global. Uh, and I think there were a couple of reasons for that beyond simply world politics. Uh, when I begin my class at Brown every fall in the history of American intervention, uh, I do point out some factors that shape world history that I think uh, those of us in the business of analyzing history underestimate. And one of them is the private psychology of individuals. I think this played a great deal into the role of the founding of the security state in the United States in this way. Uh, during the World War II, as you all know, the U.S. had uh, an, an intelligence agency, the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services. Uh, Alan Dulles was, of course, one of the leading figures of the OSS. He headed the uh, station in Switzerland, um, ran operations all over Europe. Uh, after the war was over, uh, they wanted to continue their operations in Europe. In fact, Alan Dulles had applied to become head of the OSS in all of Europe. Uh, Bill Donovan, the head of it, didn't think much of Alan Dulles's administrative abilities, so wouldn't give him that job, but agreed to make him head of the uh, OSS station in Berlin. Uh, only a few days after Alan Dulles got there to take over this job, President Harry Truman abolished the OSS, and Alan Dulles had to go home. He had to go back to work for his brother's law firm again, which he didn't like. Uh, all the other OSS officers had to go back home. And when go back home meant back to the investment bank, uh, back to the law firm, back to Wall Street, back to the people you went to Princeton with and you went to Choate with. Uh, and they weren't happy. They had been living an adrenaline-filled life right on the edge of excitement and death. They were like the British pilots during the Battle of Britain who were going to be dead from moment to moment and suddenly they're back delivering milk in Bristol. Uh, people like Alan Dulles could not handle this transition. They spent countless hours talking about how to get back in the business. How can we get back to doing something like we used to do, which was so much fun and we saved the world? Well, one way to do it was to promote the idea that there was a threat out there just as great as the threat that was posed by Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan. Uh, they heavily promoted that idea. And uh, Alan Dulles was then a co-author of the bill, the National Security Act of 1947, that created the CIA. As was referred to here already, uh, it was created in a very special way, and I think this is so important, I, I need to repeat it. It had always been the rule of Western intelligence services to separate intelligence gathering from covert action. You don't want to have the two in the same agency, otherwise every intelligence report logically ends with the conclusion, so we need a covert operation. Alan Dulles broke down that wall which was famously observed by the uh, British Secret Service, always thought to have been the gold standard in that business. So Alan Dulles wrote a bill creating an agency, the CIA, that would do both. It would do intelligence gathering, but it also act on intelligence. Uh, really a uh, dramatic and, and uh, fateful change. Um, Alan Dulles then uh, maneuvered himself into the new CIA very quickly. Um, and brought a number of the old OSS men with him, including his former deputy from Switzerland, Richard Helms. They moved into the CIA together, and as you all know, uh, Alan Dulles then became head of the CIA under Eisenhower in 1953. Now, 
Eisenhower had a very important role in the foundation of the situation that we're talking about right now. It was not known at the time, nor could it have been, but Eisenhower was a fierce supporter of the idea of covert action. He loved the idea of using the CIA to overthrow foreign governments. Um, now, he never explained why he so strongly supported covert action, uh, because he never admitted that there was any. Uh, in fact, in his memoir, he lies specifically and explicitly about what he knew and what he did. Uh, he would have said, I'm sure if we could bring him back now, those weren't lies. Uh, I was protecting national security. Uh, so why, what, what would he say if he could come back and, and be honest with us uh, about why he supported these covert operations? Well, I think one thing he, he would have told us is that from his point of view, covert action was a peace project. Don't forget Eisenhower had to sp send kids off to die by the thousands in World War II. This must have weighed on him. When Alan Dulles came to him with this idea, I can overthrow a foreign government and get rid of your problem in country X for just a few dollars and hardly anyone will die, it sounded great to Eisenhower. He felt that he had saved lives on both sides. So you deftly resolve a problem, and uh, you do it without excessive bloodshed. Now, um, this was a great uh, fantasy, and I think this might have been the second thing that Eisenhower might tell us now. What he would have said, if he was being honest, when I started authorizing covert operations to overthrow governments in foreign countries, this was a new project. We never had to do this before. In the old days, when we wanted to overthrow a government, we just landed the Marines. We couldn't do that anymore because the Red Army was out there. So we had this new technique of uh, covert action. And it had never been done before. So I didn't understand what the long-term implications might be. I thought you just do it and it's over. Now, in the writing business, we're always taught to avoid cliches, but like uh, in every business, we do have some cliches that guide our own writing. Um, one cliche writers often throw around is, every story is either happy or sad, depending on where you end it. Boy, does this work for covert action. Uh, let's take our first uh, covert action in the Dulles Eisenhower era, 1953, Mossadegh in Iran. Actually, Eisenhower did not come into office with any anti Mossadegh feelings. Later, he became a great promoter of covert action and reprimanded Alan Dulles for saying that burning the Cuban sugar fields would work with Castro. He wanted something more, something bigger. And Eisenhower went on to become the first and possibly only president to authorize the assassination of foreign leaders. But in the early days, he didn't come in with any feelings against Mossadegh. But the Dulles brothers did. Uh, John Foster Dulles was the senior partner at Sullivan and Cromwell, the, the law firm that represented most of the major American multinational corporations. Uh, one of those corporations uh, was the Schroeder Bank, which was the financial agent for the Anglo-Iranian oil company a long-time client of Sullivan and Cromwell. And of course, um, Dulles would have realized that if Mossadegh in Iran could get away with nationalizing his country's main resource, other countries might want to nationalize their own resources. And this could upset the whole way the world is run. Therefore, John Foster Dulles was particularly eager to overthrow Mossadegh. Alan Dulles had his own motivation. Alan Dulles' greatest success in his legal career was getting the Shah of Iran to sign on to what was then the largest development project in world history, in which a consortium of American engineering firms would come to Iran and completely transform the country. Uh, Mossadegh and his National Front killed that project. And Alan Dulles didn't forget that either. So they came in with the desire to overthrow Mossadegh, uh, and they persuaded Eisenhower to do it. In fact, we can now follow the uh, process by which this coup was approved through the declassified documents. And there's only one moment when uh, any 
a member of the US government expresses any doubt. And it's Eisenhower himself. They're in a meeting of the National Security Council, and Eisenhower says something like, I'm glad we're getting rid of this communist Mossadegh, but I didn't even know he was a communist. <laughs> and in fact, Mossadegh was an elderly feudal landlord who despised all socialist ideas. Um, and uh, John Foster Dulles had the great answer. Oh, you're right, he's not a communist, but uh, Iran is a big country. It's right on the border of the Soviet Union. It has a lot of oil. Mossadegh is old. He's sick. He could die. There's a communist party in Iran. It's too dangerous a situation to be allowed to continue. And Eisenhower agreed, went ahead and launched that operation. As you all know from reading an interesting book about it, uh, it only took Kermit Roosevelt three weeks in the summer of 1953 to throw Iran into complete chaos and organize a project by which Mossadegh was overthrown. So, if you could stop history right there, it seemed like the perfect ending. We got rid of a guy we didn't like, Mossadegh, and we replaced him with a guy, the Shah, who would do whatever we wanted. Sounded like the perfect ending. But history doesn't stop. And you can trace that forward now to today. The, the Shah that we placed back in power ruled with increasing repression for 25 years. His repression produced the explosion of the late 1970s, what we call the Islamic Revolution. That brought to power a clique of fanatically anti-American mullahs who have spent decades working intently and sometimes quite violently to undermine American interests all over the world. That revolution also emboldened Iran's enemy, Saddam Hussein, next door to invade Iran. We were so angry at Iran for overthrowing our Shah in the hostage crisis that we embraced Saddam. We provided him with help in his war against Iran. That was the beginning of our spiral down into the Iraq disaster we're still in. Uh, that revolution of 1979 also terrified the Soviets, who thought that radical Islam would now be penetrating through their southern border. That was one of the motivations that led them to invade Afghanistan. That's what brought us into our death cycle in Afghanistan, from which we're still not able to uh, extract ourselves. And our confrontation with Iran continues to uh, be a major part of our foreign policy. So a lot of history unfolded uh, from three weeks in the summer of 1953. Alan Dulles and Eisenhower followed this path relentlessly through the 1950s. The very next year after overthrowing uh, Mossadegh, their next target was Arbenz in Guatemala, who had had the temerity to propose a land reform law that affected the interests of United Fruit Company, one of the oldest and most faithful clients of Sullivan and Cromwell. The Dulles brothers had personally been in Guatemala working for the United Fruit Company and arranging its uh, contracts with past dictators. So they wanted to get rid of him for those reasons that stem directly from that. So why do we carry out these operations? What is the motivation? Um, is it really strategic that we feel we're under threat from a foreign enemy? Or is it economic? Is it business? The more I try to parse this, the more I realize the two of them go very closely together. So we look at somebody like Arbenz or Mossadegh or later on, Sukarno, uh, Lumumba, so many other third world leaders. And we say, these people are not, uh, so are not on board with our foreign policy, particularly they're bothering American companies. That, it always starts with that. There's some corporation that has a problem with the local government. This corporation then goes to the US government and asks for help. It's there that the motivation changes. The US government does not intervene in order to protect the rights of corporations. They convince themselves, or we, let's put it ourselves, we as the US, we convince ourselves that the only reason the government of country X would be bothering an American company, like trying to nationalize resources or trying to impose a labor code, would be that they're strategically anti-American. They're in league with our enemies. That's the reason we want to overthrow them. Not because they're bothering the companies, it's because they're against us geopolitically. How do we know they're against us geopolitically? Because they're bothering American companies. So the motivation morphs a little bit, but remains essentially the same. Uh, now, this policy of intervention reached a peak under Eisenhower uh, with the two orders 
to assassinate Castro and assassinate Lumumba. As far as we know, these are the only two orders that came from a president uh, to assassinate foreign leaders. Uh, the uh, church committee later uh, came up with a great word to describe how Eisenhower ordered these uh, assassinations. I don't know if this one would get through your spell check. He, he ordered them circumlocutiously. <laughs> I want that guy sawed off. It's pretty circumlocutious. Uh, so, we carried out these assassination projects as ways to promote the uh, same regime change operations that we'd been involved with all over the world. All of these are motivated by the idea that our sphere of influence includes the whole world. Uh, James Bond was a great influence on Alan Dulles and on President Kennedy, unfortunately. I think one of the, uh, the great wrong lessons that James Bond teaches us is that one guy can go out and solve a big world problem and there's never any repercussions. You close the book and the story's over. I think Kennedy may have fantasized this himself. Don't forget Kennedy was also the guy who increased our troop strength in uh, Vietnam from 800 to 16,000. He was the person who named the chief law enforcement officer of the United States, Robert Kennedy, to coordinate a process to assassinate leaders in foreign countries. Uh, all of this has led us to the belief we have today that we must be involved in every conflict in the world and that we're good at it. We'll improve things. There doesn't seem to be any limit to the number of times these operations can go wrong before we question whether they are wise or not. Um, now, I mentioned that when I was writing my book about that first debate back in 1898, I made this discovery that the debate ever happened and also a little bit about Mark Twain. As often happens, uh, when you're embarked in projects like this, you make other discoveries. Uh, I discovered a great American uh, who I had known something about, but not much, uh, William Graham Sumner. He's in one of the books you've just been given. He wrote a wonderful essay, which is in that book called The Conquest of the United States by Spain, in which he argues that we, we defeated them militarily, but they defeated us by forcing us to adopt their oppressive colonial mentality. Uh, he, William Graham Sumner was the found, founder of uh, sociology as a discipline. Not incidentally, he's the uh, inventor of the term ethnocentrism. So I just want to close by reading you a speech that he made in 1898 and ask you to reflect on its relevance. The great foe of democracy now and in the near future is plutocracy. Every year that passes brings out this antagonism more distinctly. It is to be the social war of the 20th century. In that war, militarism, expansion, and imperialism will all favor plutocracy. Therefore, expansion and imperialism are a grand onslaught on democracy. Thank you. Two-day debate is, is quite humbling. Every issue on the question of intervention that we now discuss was first discussed then. So all of American foreign policy can effectively be reduced down to one question or, or down to one word, really. It's intervention. Where do we intervene? When? Under what circumstances? With what tools? With what goals? And that hasn't changed over a period of more than 100 years. So the arguments that we used on both sides when we debated as a nation whether to intervene in Vietnam, Central America, Iraq, Syria are the very same ones that were used in this debate uh, in the early months of 1899 in the U.S. Senate. Uh, yeah, the one depressing thing about that uh, debate is that the senators then were so much more articulate. <laughs> Even the bad guys were brilliant. Their speeches are masterpieces of classical oratory laced with references to 
Pliny the Elder, the Cataline Conspiracy, things you would never dream of discussing with a U.S. Senator today. Um, that re, uh, that uh, debate is so full of meaning, I, I want to suggest that somehow maybe the Friends of Freedom would like to publish it uh, as, a, as a pamphlet so that Americans can see how these debates were so brilliantly argued at that time. Uh, I'm not going to go into this in great depth, but let me just give you one quick exchange between the two Republican senators from Massachusetts, uh, Henry Cabot Lodge, who was the great Mephistopheles of the Imperial Project back then, and uh, his opposite number, George Frisbee Hoare, who was an outspoken anti-imperialist. And both of these arguments are arguments you still hear today. Here's Henry Cabot Lodge. I do not believe that this nation was raised up for nothing. I have faith that it has a great mission in the world, a mission of good, a mission of freedom. I believe it can live up to that mission. Therefore, I want to see it step forward boldly and take its place at the head of nations. This led Senator George Frisbee Hoare to leap to his feet and reply, you have no right at the cannon's mouth to impose on an unwilling people your declaration of independence and your constitution. North America is not enough for us. We need to project our coercive and military power further than that. And that was the period when, of course, we took the Philippines and Guam and Puerto Rico and assumed responsibility for Cuba and began setting out on the path that has led us to where we are now. I had always understood, however, that we made this decision more or less automatically, that it was just the logical next step. We got to California, and then the next step was Hawaii and the Philippines. It was a sort of a uh, reasonable progression in which the American people were complicit. But actually the opposite is true. The United States erupted in a nationwide debate over whether this was a good idea. In the summer of 1898, there was a great uh, explosion of anti-imperialist uh, sentiment in the United States. A war that began with the purpose of liberating Cuba turned during that summer into something very different. Suddenly, after having sunk the Spanish fleet in the Philippines, we began to think, maybe we should take the Philippines, we should take Hawaii, we should replace Spain, we should join other European nations in the scramble for territories and influence around the world. This created an eruption of protest. And during that year, 1898 and through 1899, this was the subject that riveted the American people. I can tell you from many hours cranking microfilms in the New York Public Library dark room that this was on the front pages of every newspaper every day. Every major American political and intellectual leader took sides in this debate. In the autumn of 1898, President McKinley decided that he would impose on Spain a treaty by which we would take the Philippines and other uh, Spanish possessions and embark on our imperial project. At this point, anti-imperialist sentiment became intense. An organization called the Anti-Imperialist League emerged. It had chapters all around the United States. It staged hundreds of public meetings, distributed hundreds of thousands of leaflets and broadsides, lobbied intensively in Washington. Uh, it's a piece of our history that we've forgotten because I think it's something that uh, maybe we're not uh, told is a good thing for us to remember. But when you go back and read, as I have, the speeches that were made at that time, you can't... Our next speaker, Stephen Kinzer, is a former New York Times reporter and is currently a world affairs columnist for the Boston Globe. Having taught at both Northwestern University and Boston University, he is also currently a senior fellow in international and public affairs at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University. A longtime critic of America's interventionist foreign policy, 
Kinger's books include Bitter Fruit, the story of the American coup in Guatemala, All the Shah's Men, an American coup in the roots of Middle East terror, Overthrow, America's Century of Regime Change from Hawaii to Iraq, The Brothers, John Foster Dulles, Alan Dulles, and Their Secret World War, and most recently, The True Flag, Theodore Roosevelt, Mark Twain, and the Birth of American Empire, all of which I have read and all of which I cannot recommend too highly. They are absolutely fantastic books on America's uh, history of foreign interventionism. The title of Stephen's talk is Regime Change, Roots of the Imperial Temptation. Please welcome Stephen Kinzer. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here and especially uh, to be following two uh, such eminent scholars. Uh, you've now been given by the last two speakers a, a picture of where we were around the period of the early 1960s and the Kennedy assassination. So I've been asked to give something like a prequel to those speeches. Uh, how did we get here? I've been told by my publishers that uh, journalists' memoirs never sell. The only people that ever buy them are other journalists. Uh, therefore, uh, despite my efforts, I've been told by several publishers, you're, you're never going to sell a memoir. Forget it. So I've, I've dropped out the idea of ever writing a memoir, but I do have a title. My other books usually work the other way. I get the book done and then come up with a title. Now I have a title for which there never will be a book. But it does encapsulate my approach to uh, trying to understand America and the world. Help but be struck with how prescient the anti-imperialists were in those days. Let me just give you an example or two. The very first anti-imperialist meeting in American history was held on June 15, 1898 at Faneuil Hall in Boston. It was exactly on this theme I mentioned. Shall we now use the Cuban War as an excuse to become an imperial power? That speech was, that, that uh, rally was opened by a speech by Reverend Charles Ames, a leading uh, Unitarian theologian of that era. Ask yourself how true this came. The policy of imperialism threatens to change the temper of our people and to put us into a permanent attitude of arrogance, testiness, and defiance toward other nations. Once we enter the field of international conflict as a great military and naval power, we shall be one more bully among bullies. We shall only add one more to the list of oppressors of mankind. That was 1898. Uh, now, that autumn, President McKinley decided that he would proceed with the project of annexation and world power. He instructed his negotiators in Europe to impose this treaty on Spain, and that treaty had to be ratified by the U.S. Senate. This set off a 32-day debate in the Senate over whether this was the right thing to do or not. Other than the time when the Founding Fathers gathered to write our Constitution, there has never been a debate in our history when so many Gifted figures came together to de debate so profoundly an issue so heavily fraught with meaning for the entire world. In some ways, I envy those senators and those Americans who lived then because they had this great debate. Is projecting our military and coercive power around the world a good thing or is it a bad thing? Will it help us? Will it help peace? Or will it undermine peace? This is a debate that we don't have anymore. That's why I envy them. We debate, is 3,000 troops the right number for our surge in Afghanistan, or is 6,000 a better number? We never debate the larger questions. And here was the last time the United States did that. Uh, I must say that going through the debates uh, the text of that 30, it's a line from one of those old movies that I love to watch um, called Arsenic and Old Lace. Remember that movie with Cary Grant? So uh, for those of you that uh, forgot that one, um, Cary Grant plays a young man who goes to visit his 
elderly aunts, and they run a rooming house in which they poison the guests. That's the, that's the theme of this comedy. And there's a wonderful spot in the movie where Cary Grant turns to one of his aunts to try to understand what's happening. The aunt says, oh, the gentleman died because he drank wine that had poison in it. And Cary Grant's eyes pop open and he says, but how did the poison get in the wine? That's going to be the title of my non-existent memoir. That's all I ask myself. So the wine of world peace and discord and, and uh, social peace in the United States has been poison. How did the poison get in the wine? Essentially, I've devoted my career to trying to answer that question. The answers are not to be found uh, just in the last few years. And I want to try to take us back to the beginnings and a, a little bit of the story of how we got to this point that has been so aptly uh, described, particularly in, in uh, that last speech. Uh, we sometimes look for the roots of uh, America's uh, reckless intervention in the world in the period after World War II. I think that's a mistake. That's too late. It actually began before that. You can look at the period of American imperial expansion essentially in three sections. First, we created a continental empire inside North America. Second, in the period around the end of the 19th century, we moved towards creating an overseas empire. And then the final phase came after World War II when we moved to the idea of creating global empire. But our first great debate over whether this was a good idea took place in the wake of the Spanish-American War. This was a huge debate that involved the entire United States. And this is something that was new to me as I began my research for my most recent book. I always understood that it was the period of the Spanish-American War that led us into the period of imperial expansion. It was that moment when we decided 